والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا يا كريم Dear colleagues Now in this lecture we are going to uh, to continue the uh, series of the head and neck imaging there are uh, two remaining lectures in this uh, series for the time being the first one is about the imaging of the mandible and, and the temporomandibular joint and the second one is about the uh, imaging of uh, head and neck infections then uh, the head and neck infection is uh, not yet ready but uh, we will handle uh, now the imaging of the mandible and I hope very soon we can uh, present this uh, head and neck infection and you know that uh, there are a lot of imaging techniques for evaluation of the mandible and the jaw in general including the conventional x-rays with the panoramic view as well as the CT scan MRI and some of the uh, angiographic techniques which are performed by CT or uh, MRI the uh, traditional way um, uh, for examination of the mandible or primary evaluation of the mandible was the conventional x-rays and these x-rays were obtained in the frontal view as you can see here and in uh, box oblique views for assessment of the uh, left uh, mandibular ramus and condyle and uh, also the oblique view for assessment of the right uh, mandibular ramus and the condyle and uh, uh, since a very long time we have used to this uh, to use this uh, uh, examination which is the uh, mandibular panorama or the panoramic view of the mandible which is obtained by a special machine and is considered the simple x-ray of the mandible where you can uh, you can have the uh, uh, spreaded view for the mandible from left to right including the mandibular condyle the coronoid process on both sides in the mandibular ramus and the mandibular body and you can also have a very good idea about the teeth whether in the mandible or in the uh, alveolar margin and uh, for a, a good time we have uh, used also the conventional CT for evaluation of the of the mandible and uh, in order to study the mandible by CT we should have the axial and the coronal sections and the axial sections are obtained uh, uh, parallel to the inferior border of the mandible uh, starting just below the uh, uh, border of the mandible and uh, we proceed uh, superiorly until we finish or we reach uh, the skull base in the coronal images the um, the sections are obtained from uh, posterior to anterior uh, starting from the region of the temporomandibular joint and you proceed perpendicular to the inferior border of the mandible until we finish the alveolar march the sections are obtained in the range of um, uh, three millimeter slice intervals and we uh, should have the soft and the bone window images we, we may need to inject uh, contrast material sometimes and we should ensure in every head and neck study the symmetric patient, patient position to facilitate interpretation of the images and uh, whenever we uh, we have the uh, multi-detector machines we can obtain the 3d uh, images for the mandible and uh, the zygoma the uh, alveolar margin as well uh, as i have mentioned we should have the uh, soft tissue and the, the bone window images and these are uh, usually displayed on the films or on the cds uh, this is the difference between the soft tissue and where you can see the details of the orbit, the details of the brain tissue, while in the bone window images you can better evaluate the uh, lesions containing calcium such as this chondrosarcoma in the barocellar area 
and also you can see the uh, the bones of the orbit and the decalvarial bones as well but you are not able to evaluate uh, adequately the soft tissue structures now we uh, uh, will have some idea about the anatomy of this area uh, starting by the axial images which uh, be begin uh, at the inferior border of the mandible and uh, proceed superiorly this is the uh, uh, symphysis menti or the midline part of the mandible and you go upward and you, you can see the teeth and this is the uh, uh, start of the mandibular ramus then in this area you can see this is the ramus of the mandible and this is the styloid process and here you can see the maxillary sinus on both sides and this is the bony nasal septum uh, more above and you can see better the maxillary antra the bony nasal septum this is the ramus of the mandible and this is the styloid process and here of course the cervical spine then uh, more uh, above uh, upward sections and you can see the maxillary sinuses and this is the pterygoid blades we have uh, discussed the in full details the anatomic uh, structure in this area uh, in the lecture of the maxillofacial trauma and in the lecture of the para imaging of the parapharyngeal spaces and many times we have uh, mentioned that and also in the imaging of the paranasal sinuses in here the maxillary sinus the zygomatic bone and this is the mandibular condyle will articulate with the uh, temporal bone in the region of the temporomandibular joint and this is the zygomatic arch maxillary sinus bony nasal septum then pterygoid blades and he, of course you remember this very narrow space which he refers to the pterygobalatine fossa and in the coronal images you start uh, from posterior you can see the temporomandibular joints bilaterally and uh, this is the head of the mandible the temporal fossa for the articulation with the head of the mandible then uh, this is uh, the sphenoid sinus this is the ramus of the mandible the pterygoid uh, blades on both sides and more anteriorly and you can see these are the pterygoid blades this is the ramus of the mandible and then the sphenoid sinus and here you can see the region of the heart ballot and this is the bony nasal septum, maxillary sinuses, ethmoidal air cells, orbital cavities, superior orbital wall or orbital roof and the floor. Then, uh, some words about the floor of the mouth. We also have mentioned this many times before. You remember this very important midline, almost midline muscle, which is GG or the genoglossus and the, you have two uh, muscles lateral to it which are the hyoglossus and the, the styloglossus then you see the uh, the submandibular salivary gland on both sides and this is the sternocleidomastoid muscle on both sides then if you go uh, further uh, down then you can see this is the uh, genoglossus uh, muscle and uh, the uh, submandibular salivary glands and uh, the stylo uh, the sternocleidomastoid muscle and lower down you will see the muscle which uh, is attached between the mandible and the hyoid bone and this is the hyoglossus uh, muscle the submandibular salivary gland and uh, the sternomastoid muscles you remember that uh, the multi-detector uh, CT has facilitated the images of complex anatomic areas such as the region of the maxillofacial, uh, uh, maxillofacial region and we have the major advantages of very rapid scanning, the vertical reconstruction, vascular imaging and the virtual endoscopy. Instead of a single detector in front of the X-ray tube, so we can have more than one detector in front of the tube, and we get uh, the sections according to the number of the detectors in front of the tube. If you have four detectors, and then you can have four sections per tube rotation, then you can have faster scans. 
and uh, you are able to reconstruct the images in a more better way and you can evaluate easily the remus of the mandible and also you can have the CT panorama or uh, which is more of course uh, 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 detailed anatomic structures obtained by CT compared to those obtained by the plain x-ray and you have the facility to reconstruct the images in a 3d uh, fashion or manner and uh, this is extremely valuable as i have mentioned before in evaluation of maxillofacial uh, trauma in particular but you you can also uh, reconstruct the region of the mandible in a 3d way so that you are able to assess the region of the temporomandibular joint and you have a good anatomic details as well as also the uh, pathologic uh, details as well and this is in uh, a 3d reconstructed image for the mandible and you can see the ramus of the body you can see the temporomandibular joint the coronoid uh, process and uh, you can rotate the images of course as you like then you can see the styloid process you can see the temporomandibular joint as well as the rest of the uh, mandibular anatomy and recently we have uh, what is known as comb beam uh, CT and uh, this is a compact uh, CT machine which is uh, very small in size and uh, it uh, uses a cone-shaped x-ray beam and a single uh, 3d or volumetric detector thing single detector and uh, this is the whole machine the patient uh, chin is here and the, the uh, skull and face are in between the tube and the detector then one of the uh, important uh, advantages of this machine is the radiation dose which is uh, 100 times less than that of the regular uh, CT scan this uh, comb beam CT uh, the the detector this one and the tube rotate around the, the patient head so that you can have this 3D image for the mandible and the, the maxillofacial area then after you have this 3D image and you can select the desired part to be uh, further evaluated in the axial and the coronal uh, planes as you can see here and the, this is um, a 2D uh, comb beam CT of the mandible and you want to look carefully uh, to the area of the mandibular canal for example then you select this area in particular then the scan will uh, uh, give you more detailed images in the uh, axial in the coronal in the sagittal planes whatever you like the, the plane of imaging and you can have uh, such images then uh, Combeam CT is, uh, is capable only to examine the maxillofacial area uh, uh, in the way I have mentioned. And you can examine the baronasal sinuses, you can examine the mandible, the alveolar margin, and uh, uh, the related structures in, 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 uh, in bone and the soft tissue window uh, settings then uh, we uh, are going to handle the mandibular pathology in uh, these three uh, items number one the mandibular cysts and the, the tumors then we'll show some of the uh, miscellaneous uh, conditions now uh, mandibular cysts and we used to uh, divide the lesions of the mandible as those originating from the odontogenic structures and uh, others which can occur in the mandible similar to any, bo any bone in the human body which are non-odontogenic non cysts and the odontogenic cysts include the radicular cyst, the residual cyst and the, the dentigerous cyst the non-odontogenic cysts include the fissural or incisive canal cyst the stephane cyst, the simple cyst and the, the aneurysmal bone cyst then the bone tumors are also subdivided into odontogenic and non-odontogenic. The uh, odontogenic uh, benign tumors include 
for the most common one is the ameloblastoma and we have the myxoma and the uh, keratinizing odontogenic tumor or the odontogenic keratocyst then we have sclerotic lesions like odontoma and the cementoma and we have mixed sclerotic and osteolytic lesions benign non-odontogenic uh, tumors include the osteoma chondroma giant cell tumor any tumor which can occur elsewhere in the body then the malignant lesions are also include the odontogenic malignant tumors which are relatively rare the tumors extending to the mandible from adjacent uh, areas like the nasopharynx the oropharynx the tongue and the mouth mouth floor then uh, mandibular sarcomas and like osteogenic sarcoma, chondrosarcoma, ewing sarcoma, and the metastatic disease. And these are the uh, uh, man, uh, mandibular sarcomas, which uh, sometimes seen in the clinical practice, especially the osteosarcoma, but um, less frequently we see fibrosarcoma, chondrosarcoma, and ewing sarcoma. Uh, starting by the cysts and uh, uh, starting by the odontogenic cysts, we have the radicular cyst, the residual cyst, and the, the dentigerous cyst. Red the radicular cyst arises from the two derivatives, and uh, it is intimately related to the root of a, a tooth which is uh, affected by dental cares. Then uh, if you look here for this uh, classification, we have the three types of cysts. The radicular cyst, which is related to the root of the tooth. The uh, lateral periodontal cyst, which is located between the root of the teeth. And the uh, dentigerous cyst, which is related to the uh, crown of uh, an unerupted tooth, uh, I will uh, mention. Then, uh, this is one of the common lesions, the radicular cyst or periapical cyst, one of the common lesions in the jaw. It may represent about 65% uh, of uh, cysts seen in the mandible. And uh, this is the age incidence, which is between 30 and 50 years of, of age. And uh, it is considered an inflammatory cyst, uh, which is related to the apex of a carous tooth. Then here in this example, and you see the the apex of this of this tooth is related to a cystic lesion, and this cyst is in the range of one centimeter in diameter. It may be smaller or larger than this, and sometimes you have a cortex for this cyst, which is re relatively uh, sclerotic, and you see that there may be some of some abnormalities of the root related to the cyst. Then uh, the residual cyst is applied to any cyst that remains or develops after surgical removal of a tooth. Then you see a cyst here after removal of a, tooth and you, of a tooth and you may say that this is a residual cyst and this is also an example. You see the missing teeth here and this is a residual cyst. Then uh, the dentigerous cyst is one of the common lesions seen in the uh, in the mandible. It is a painless uh, cystic lesion in seen in young adults, and it occurs around the crown of an erupted tooth. And you see this is uh, this is the unerupted tooth, and you see a cyst which is surrounding the tooth. And uh, by definition, the root of the affected tooth should be outside uh, the, the cyst itself. And this is a good example of a cystic lesion which is related to uh, the crown of an erupted tooth and in a typical of a follicular or dentigerous cyst. You use the CT scan with uh, 2D reconstruction and you see a cystic lesion in the mandibular ramus which is related to the crown of this unerupted tooth diagnostic of the integerous cyst. And uh, as I have mentioned, the root of the affected tooth is usually outside the cyst. And uh, the cyst is related to the crown more or less of the, of the unerupted tooth. This lesion has no 
extra osseous soft tissue component and it is a benign lesion and is treated by extraction of the tooth and the removal of the cyst. Then the non-odontogenic cysts, as I have mentioned, include the fissural or incisive canal cyst, the staphyl cyst, the symbol and aneurysmal bone cysts. The incisive canal is uh, this canal which is uh, leading from the floor of the uh, nasal cavity into the palatal surface of the maxilla. And you see here, this is the incisive canal and in the sagittal image and this is the incisive canal in the coronal image. Sometimes you got a cystic lesion which is related to the site of the incisive canal between the root of the uh, incisive uh, teeth and um, this is one of the common lesions seen in the clinical practice and a little bit more common in males and it uh, appears like uh, swelling in the roof of the mouth as you can see here and the, this is do not involve uh, the root of the related teeth and this is an example you see a lesion which is located anteriorly in the uh, midline in of the hard uh, palate and by the occlusal film you see the site of the cyst between the root of the incisive teeth this is also a good example of uh, this incisive canal cyst or also known as nasopalatine duct cyst which is located in the midline of the floor of the mouth anteriorly between the root of the incisive teeth and uh, you see here the incisors and you see this is the cystic lesion between the root of the teeth and it's well defined benign uh, lesion this is also another example by CT in the uh, sagittal uh, and axial images the cyst is midline located in the anterior part of the heart palate corresponding to the site of the incisive canal then uh, similar to any other bone in the body simple bone cyst you know the most common sites for simple bone cyst in the body is the proximal humerus and the proximal femur but uh, simple bone cyst can occur anywhere and also can affect the mandible but uh, it is a cyst like structure and uh, this cyst is unilocular uh, and it contains fluid but from the uh, from the mandibular panorama or even by CT scan you are able to see this cystic structure with no internal loculation and the contents are uh, more or less simple fluid. Uh, the value of MRI here is to confirm that the cyst is unilocular and that the fluid is uh, a serous fluid not uh, other types of fluid as we can see. But in the mandibular panorama, you just say that this is a unilocular cystic lesion in the mandible, which may uh, contribute to a simple bone cyst. Then uh, uh, this is also another example, and you see as a, a unilocular symbol uh, or cyst-like structure within the uh, the mandible, and the related the roots of the teeth are intact, and this is. Uh, may suggest the possibility of a simple bone cyst. An urismal bone cyst is a lesion also can occur in the mandible. It is an expanding lesion and is multilocular and is characterized by the presence of multiple fluid fluid levels as in uh, the rest of the of the body. But here you see a big lesion which uh, has uh, eroded the mandibular cortex and um, uh, there, are, there are loosening of the related uh, teeth. And you cannot predict the nature of the lesion from this uh, uh, plain x-rays. And this is an example of a, a cystic lesion which is related to the uh, root of the teeth. Some of the roots are uh, eroded 
then uh, the uh, CT scan showed a big cystic lesion expanding the uh, the mandible there and in this bone window image you cannot appreciate the presence of internal fluid levels but this is one of the main values of MRI actually in evaluation or in uh, helping into the diagnose this aneurysmal bone cyst in the mandible is by the presence of uh, multiple fluid uh, levels within the lesion and this is classic for aneurysmal bone cyst anywhere in the body and this lesion it affects the right side of the mandible it's expanding and it contains multiple uh, fluid levels this is also a good example of an aneurysmal bone cyst in the left mandible and you can feel sometimes that there are internal loculation and uh, multiple fluid levels this is also a third example of a cystic lesion uh, expanding the left side of the mandible and uh, breaching the cortex the ct scan showed mixed uh, internal densities and the internal loculations suggesting the possibility of an aneurysmal bone cyst and here if you look carefully and you can see that there is an expanding lesion near the head of the mandible on the right side these are the 3d images obtained by ct scan and you can see the internal loculations of the uh, of the cystic lesion near the involving the mandibular head as well as the uh, the uh, mandibular fossa as well then uh, mri t2 weighted images showed uh, mixed signal intensities within the lesion and this may suggest the possibility of an aneurysmal bone cyst then uh, the staphine cyst is not a true cyst it is just an indentation or concavity on the inner aspect of the mandible and there are theories for the uh, development of this uh, of this uh, staphine cyst and you see this is the lesion and this is the lesion in another one another patient is uh, the most likely accepted theory is the presence of remnants of the submandibular gland in this uh, in this area and this has been uh, histologically uh, proved as a cause for this uh, staphine cyst then uh, you can see here by CT that this is not a true cyst it is just a depression on the inner part of the mandibular cortex which is caused as they said by remnants of uh, submandibular salivary tissue here and this is cone beam uh, CT images for the staphine cyst you see the cyst by the uh, uh, x-ray or the mandibular panorama and you see the cyst oh, it is not a true cyst they see the depression on the inner part of the mandible and here you can appreciate it in the uh, in the uh, full image of the mandible and then the 3d uh, reconstructed image you can also detect the cyst now we came to the benign tumors and uh, of course on top of these benign tumors uh, you know we have the odontogenic tumors and then the non-odontogenic tumors uh, the odontogenic tumors are classified into osteolytic and sclerotic and mixed lesions and on top of these lesions by far is the ameloblastoma and the ameloblastoma is a benign lesion but it is a locally aggressive tumor whenever it is uh, excised it should be removed with a safety a safety margin because of the known high rate of local recurrence this tumor is considered the, the second most common odontogenic tumor after the odontoma in the odontoma is a sclerotic lesion of course and this is an osteolytic lesion most of the lesions occur in the mandible in the range of 80 percent while about 20 percent occur in the in the maxilla and sometimes these lesions are associated with the integral cysts and unerupted teeth and in this condition the diagnosis is usually difficult then uh, you know that uh, this lesion number one is a locally aggressive lesion it erodes the related uh, roots of the teeth 
and um, it is a multilocular lesion in most of the cases although some uh, cases may appear unilocular but most of the lesions are multilocular and uh, they are locally aggressive and whenever they excise they, they, they are surgically removed they are there should be a safety margin uh, around the tumor and if you look carefully here and you see an expanding osteolytic lesion in the mandible with uh, erosion or destruction of the related uh, or re resorption of the related roots of the teeth and this is one of the suggestive criteria and here is a multilocular expanding lesion in the uh, body and the angle of the mandible by x-ray and by ct uh, reconstructed uh, image then uh, this is also a lesion uh, which is an expanding it appears the only locular uh, affecting the the mandible and uh, as i have mentioned that uh, some of the lesions may appear unilocular uh, by imaging but most of the lesions are multilocular this is the range of uh, frequency between the mandible and the maxilla 80 percent occur in the mandible and 20 percent occur in the man maxilla and the age incidence is in the third and the, the between the third and the fifth decades of life then look here and you see an expanding lesion in the mandible and uh, there is resorption and the erosion of the related uh, uh, roots of the of the teeth and whenever it is large it may erode through the cortex of the mandible destroy this cortex and extend into the adjacent the adjacent soft tissues then uh, uh, by ct and mri you can see an enhancing papillary solid structures within projecting within the lesion and this is an example of a meloblastoma in the right side of the mandible with an expansion and the erosion of the cortex and the affection of the related teeth. Then, uh, to sum up the basic information about the ameloblastoma, this is the second most common tumor after odontoma. It affects adults in the third to the fifth decades it is a single lesion occurs uh, solitary but not multiple but uh, most of the lesions are multilocular and uh, they are locally aggressive affecting the roots of the related teeth and maybe the uh, cortex of the mandible as well then the next type of the benign cystic lesions in the mandible is the odontogenic keratocyst or keratinizing tumor this uh, is a lesion which is less common in frequency and is seen in a relatively younger age in the second to the third decades of life and one of the prominent features of this lesion is that it occurs in multiplicity then whenever you see multiple lesions like this and you can e easily exclude the possibility of uh, amyloblastoma and the second one is this lesion is benign and is not locally aggressive then you can see the intact appearance of the related uh, uh, roots of the of the teeth then this is a, a, a unilocular lesion remember that uh, amyloblastoma is multilocular few cases or few percentage occur as unilocular but this lesion is primarily a unilocular pathology it uh, it contains a cheesy uh, material and um, less frequently it may show aggressive characters but in most of the cases it appear uh, benign the treatment is uh, the same uh, similar to amyloblastoma excision with a safety march then one of the helpful diagnostic criteria for odontogenic uh, keratocyst is the only locularity the uh, intact appearance of the roots of the teeth related to the tumor and also the uh, multiplicity this is one of the uh, signs that favor the diagnosis of odontogenic keratocyst and here you can see a cystic lesion where uh, the with more or less intact 
uh, appearance of the roots of the related teeth apart from minor erosive changes. And this is also an identogenic keratocyst and uh, similar to ameloblastoma, it may be also associated with an impacted tooth mi mimicking the appearance of the dentigerous cyst. Then uh, if you look here and you see it, this is a lesion which is related to the a crown of the unerupted tooth then you will you will think of a dentigerous cyst and uh, I, I will do the same but um, uh, in order to reach the diagnosis then we'll have the biopsy or the uh, uh, the diagnosis after uh, after surgery in odontogenic uh, uh, keratocyst is a unilocular disease it is relatively more benign compared to the ameloblastoma the roots of the related teeth may be may appear intact but uh, you remember sometimes this uh, this lesion may have uh, some aggressiveness but here is a classic appearance of an odontogenic keratocyst unilocular pathology the related the roots of the teeth are more or less intact and the sclerotic margin is well seen. By CT, the keratocyst is a new unilocular pathology with expansion of the, of the mandible, and you can see this uh, appearance with no uh, enhancing projections similar to the uh, amyloblastoma. And this is an odontogenic keratocyst by Combeam CT, the 2D image and the 3D image. And you see a, a lesion which is uh, almost unilocular and the, the related teeth are more or less intact. Then uh, the basic informations about the odontogenic keratocyst include and this uh, lesion is not as common as the amyloblastoma. This lesion occurs at a younger age compared to amyloblastoma. It occurs in the second to third decades, while amyloblastoma occurs in the third to fifth decades. This lesion it may occur in multiplicity, and this is not seen in with amyloblastoma. This lesion is basically unilocular, and a minor uh, percentage of amyloblastoma occur uh, uh, unilocular. It is, uh, in most of, of the cases, is benign with non-aggressive characters. Although some of the uh, uh, lesions may, may show a little bit aggressive characters. Also, you should remember that uh, keratocyst may appear septated or uh, may have some internal uh, loculations mimicking the distinction from amyloblastoma difficult. And at a time, you can you can predict or you may suggest the possibility of the lesion and if there are overlapping features you may uh, uh, not be able to reach the diagnosis before surgery and this uh, third tumor which is odontogenic uh, myxoma is a rare tumor representing about three to six percent of odontogenic lesions it is a benign lesion with uh, the slowly growing osteolytic uh, nature one of the prominent features of this is multilocularity, and uh, it has a, a s similarity to the tennis racket appearance. This lesion is expanding, and it is multilocular with uh, many internal septations simu simulating the uh, tennis racket appearance, and uh, this lesion may be locally aggressive. And you see here an expanding lesion with multiple internal septations and by x-ray and by, uh, by CT scan. This is also a, a, an odontogenic myxoma of the left side of the mandible expanding lesion with multilocular uh, appearance. And this is an odontogenic myxoma in the uh, maxillary side and you see the more or less similarity to the tennis racket appearance. Then uh, the lesion may be also mistaken for amyloblastoma, but you know that amyloblastoma is the commonest of these uh, group of the lesions, and most of these are 
uh, are relatively rare compared to the frequency of aminoblastoma. This is an odontogenic myxoma, and you see the multilocularity, which is similar to the uh, tennis racket appearance. Then uh, the, the prominent features of odontogenic uh, myxoma, number one, this lesion is rare. Number two, it occurs in a younger age than uh, amyloblastoma, now of a similar age like the keratocyst. It is a single lesion, it is multilocular, and it simulates the tennis racket, and it is a locally aggressive uh, tumor. Then we came to the sclerotic lesions, and we have odontoma and odontogenic uh, and uh, cementoma. The odontoma is the most common odontogenic tumor of the uh, of the mandible. It represents about 66% of the cases, followed by amyloblastoma in the uh, frequency of incidence. The lesion is seen in younger patients in the second decade of life. 50% of the lesions are associated with impacted tooth and uh, most of the lesions range in the size between one to three centimeters. They are totally sclerotic. They start by being osteolytic, then later on they became, uh, became sclerotic. And we have uh, two types which are uh, differentiated only by histopathology, the complex odontoma and the compound odontoma with uh, uh, identifiable tooth components within the lesion. Both, both types of odontomas cannot be differentiated by imaging. They are only differentiated by histopathology. And this is an odontoma, a sclerotic lesion related to an impacted tooth. And this is also an odontoma, which is a sclerotic lesion related to an impacted tooth. This lesion develops between the roots of the teeth. It is benign, but can be locally aggressive. And you may, you may say that most of the lesions affecting the mandible, uh, the common lesions are usually on the benign side, but they, show, they may show local aggressiveness. The lesion starts by being radiolucent, and by time it became radio-opaque, and the treatment is by surgical excision. This is a, an odontoma, which is a sclerotic lesion related to the root of these smaller teeth. And this is an odontoma, which is a sclerotic lesion related to an erupted tooth. And this is odontoma by cross appearance. And this is odontoma between the root of the teeth. Then uh, the main findings about odontoma that they are, this lesion is very is the most common. It occurs in children in the second decade of life. It can be multiple. It is solid and the sclerotic lesion commonly related to an impacted tooth like this one and it can be locally uh, aggressive. Then cementoma is a rare benign tumor. The odontoma is very common but cementoma is rare and it uh, affects usually the uh, the first mandibular molar. This is the first, the second, and the third, and it is attached to the root of the teeth, like this. But odontoma is common and is present between the roots of the teeth. And this is a cementoma or cementoblastoma, the sclerotic lesion which is attached to the root of the tooth. And this is also another lesion a sclerotic lesion which is attached to the root of the tooth which is usually the first mandibular molar and this is this tumor is rare it is solid and sclerotic and is usually attached to the uh, root of the tooth then we came to the non-odontogenic uh, tumors like osteoma chondroma chondroblastoma and the uh, giant cell tumor all uh, these lesions can occur anywhere in the body and also can affect the mandible. This is just an example of osteoma of the inner uh, table of the mandible encroaching on the mouse floor. And this is a small osteoma arising from the inner table of the mandible and by the 3D uh, reformatted images. 
And this lesion is known as, previously it was known as a reparative uh, granuloma, but now it is, uh, its name is the central giant cell granuloma. This lesion histologically is just a proliferation of the fibroblasts and giant cells resulting in an expanding osteolytic lesion in the mandible. And um, actually, it is not known whether it is an inflammatory lesion or a reactive lesion or a true neoplasm or uh, the sequelae of endocrine abnormality. Then, this lesion is uh, usually found in uh, children and young adults, and most of the lesions occur before the age of 30 years uh, old. Females are affected uh, two times more common than uh, than males and this uh, is an osteolytic expanding lesion of the of the mandible then the mandible is affected three times more common than the maxilla the lesions occurs usually anterior to the first uh, uh, permanent molar tooth and um, it can be unilocular and can be multilocular and here you see the, the lesion with uh, two main uh, histopathologic types, the aggressive one and the non-aggressive one. And this lesion, if you have the histopathology, it may simulate the brown tumor of hyperparathyroidism and also it may simulate the expanding lesion of the mandible which is known as the cherubism. Then about giant cell uh, uh, granuloma, this lesion is rare. Uh, this lesion occurs uh, in young age and in the children. It is a benign lesion, can be unilocular or multilocular, can be aggressive and non-aggressive. Then cherubism is, uh, is considered a variant of fibrous displays. There is a severe expanding lesion in the in the mandible which is an inherited as autosomal dominant disorder and um, this uh, lesion is seen in a children in the range of three to four years old uh, there is bilateral and the symmetrical involvement of the mandible with expansion and multilocular appearance and sometimes this patient may have this classic appearance which is upward turning eyes uh, expanded symmetrical multilocular cystic lesions of the mandible and uh, maxilla the uh, related teeth will be loose and uh, some may be uh, may show delayed eruption and you see there is an extensive uh, uh, affection of the mandible by uh, osteolytic lesions with uh, a lot of unerupted teeth and this is the 3D reconstructed image of an extensive uh, cherubism affecting the mandible and also uh, to a lesser extent the maxilla. You see the cystic appearance with multi-locularity. Uh, then cherubism is a rare pathology. It is an autosomal dominant lesion, occurs in a children in the range of three years old. It is a benign and extensive lesion, multilocular, and uh, very important this lesion if left may heal spontaneously then uh, we have mentioned that uh, the uh, giant cell granuloma may have the appearance of uh, cherubism and brown tumors of hyperparathyroidism of course in the brown tumors of hyperparathyroidism can appear in the mandible similar to uh, any other parts of the body these lesions are unilocular and they are expanding and they contain uh, material which is rich in hemosiderin. Then uh, if you have the MRI in the T1 weighted image, you got the black appearance of the lesion and in the T2 weighted image, you have more dark appearance of the lesion. And if you inject the contrast, you may got some minor uh, enhancement. Then. Uh, uh, the major findings for the diagnosis of brown tumors of hyperparathyroidism is the known uh, uh, clinical data of hyperparathyroidism. Then these are multiple lesions in the mandible and in the maxilla and the lesions 
uh, uh, showed some healing and the sclerosis after the removal of the parathyroid adenoma. Then uh, uh, the major issues to be known for the cystic lesions related uh, to the hyperparathyroidism in the mandible is uh, that they, these lesions are relatively uncommon, they are unilocular, and there should be a clinical and the laboratory evidences of hyperparathyroidism. And one of the major manifestations of hyperparathyroidism in the mandible is loss of the lamina dura of the teeth. And this uh, sclerotic line surrounding the root uh, of the tooth is known as the lamina dura. And because it is made of um, a very fine calcified, uh, uh, very fine calcification, it is. Uh, one of the most common sites to be affected whenever calcium is removed uh, uh, due to the hyperparathyroidism and uh, this is uh, a very good example for uh, resorption or loss of the lamina dura in a case of hyperparathyroidism. Then if you see a loss of the lamina dura and you see an expanding lesion in the mandible, you may think of a brown tumor and you, you can investigate the patient for the possibility of hyperparathyroidism. And finally, we came to the uh, malignant tumors and um, the uh, amyloblastoma, for example, may, may be uh, may present in a malignant form or a very aggressive destructive form and uh, here he, he, the only way to say that this is malignant is the presence of cortical destruction extra osseous soft tissue component and the spread in the adjacent uh, soft tissues then at that time you can say that this is a melocarcinoma or a malignant transformation of the ameloblastoma and here you see the destruction and you see the extra osseous soft tissue extension and these are the prominent features of any malignant tumor anywhere in the body is a destructive change in extra osseous spread but osteal reaction and the invasion of the adjacent structures and this uh, amyloblastic carcinoma or amylocarcinoma is a, is considered rare compared to the amyloblastoma which is very common and uh, uh, this is an aggressive tumor uh, and it has a wide range of age uh, uh, group appearance with no uh, sex predilection this is uh, diagnosed by the appearance of an aggressive lesion with cortical destruction and the invasion of the adjacent soft tissue structures this you have uh, seen this uh, lesion before and this is the reconstructed ct image of the same uh, lesion an osteosarcoma can occur in the flat bones of the mandible and the, the calvarial bones as well and um, this is uh, one of the uh, common primary malignant tumors in the skeleton after uh, multiple myeloma and uh, one of the best diagnostic clues for osteosarcoma is the presence of this typical Berosia reaction which is known as the sun ray speculation and the sun ray speculation is seen in the soft tissue component of the tumor extending outside the confinement of the affected bone and this is also in a classic appearance of osteosarcoma of the mandible with the radiating sun ray speculations of the bare osteo reaction. Osteosarcomas of the mandible represent about 9% of all osteosarcomas elsewhere in the body. And this is classic appearance of osteosarcoma of the mandible with the typical sun ray speculation in the extra osseous uh, soft tissue component. And this is also a classic appearance of an osteosarcoma of the uh, left mandible with the uh, speculations or the sun ray speculations as you can see here in the bone and in the soft tissue window images. And also metastasis can affect the, um, the mandible and um, uh, for the diagnosis of metastatic disease, a known history of primary malignancy should be present. Then uh, this patient with carcinoma of the colon and it has a destructive lesion in the ramus of the mandible representing a metastatic deposit. And here a patient with bronchogenic carcinoma 
with uh, mass destroying the right mandibular ramus representing in a metastatic deposit. I will stop here uh, and I'll continue the imaging of the temporomandibular joint uh, after that. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.